Hey everyone, so today we are going to look uh, a little more closely at the indigenous regions of North America. Uh, we will sort of do a very brief overview on those nine regions. So here we have our map of what is now known as the United States and Canada. Um, and we can see that we have grouped uh, the United States and Canada into nine distinct regions. Uh, just a quick note, even though we've grouped uh, indigenous nations into nine different regions, sort of based on similarities we see, uh, it is important to note that every indigenous group, uh, every indigenous nation um, in these regions has a unique uh, culture, has unique practices, um, but we are going to take a look at some of the things uh, that um, make them similar. So we are going to start uh, in the northeast uh, part of the United States um, and take a look at some similarities between the northeast nations. So these Northeast nations are in what we now think of as the Northeast part of the United States and New England. Uh, we see that these nations sort of extend into uh, Eastern Canada. Some of the geography uh, landmarks that are going to impact um, Northeast nations way of life. Uh, we know that they've got parts of the Appalachian Mountains. We know that there are a lot of dense forests. Um, and we also know that there are many sort of rivers and lakes, uh, including those great lakes that we see um, around Michigan and Wisconsin uh, and New York. So who exactly were the Northeast nations? Uh, we know that the Northeast nations were originally hunter-gatherers um, and they uh, sort of turned to farming. Uh, we know that around 5,000 BCE uh, is around the time uh, that agriculture sort of starts to be seen in the Americas. Um, and so the Northeast nations do adapt agriculture and that surplus of food allows them to build permanent settlements that number in the hundreds. Um, we see many, many villages all along uh, in the Northeast region uh, that do have many, many members. Uh, one sort of larger nation in particular that's sort of important to know um, is the Iroquois nation. Um, and it is actually sort of a uh, sort of umbrella term for many groups that sort of shared common language. Um, and we see in the Iroquois nation sort of as a whole that there is more gender equality, um, which we're going to see is something that uh, sets the Northeast nations apart. And we also see that the Iroquois actually join together to create the Iroquois League. We also hear it called the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, and this is sort of an alliance that um, promotes trade and a common defense. Um, and this is actually sort of really reminiscent uh, or sort of reminds people of sort of what we have in the United States today. Um, and the men who wrote the U.S. Constitution did know about the Iroquois Confederacy and did adapt some of uh, those principles while writing the, the U.S. Constitution and um, sort of forming uh, the United States government. So moving south, um, we have the Southeast nations. Um, and the Southeast nations are located in 
the sort of southeast region of the United States. We see uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, um, all of those states that we tend to think of as southeastern states today. We see those, um, we sort of see that same grouping uh, when we're talking about uh, indigenous nations as well. Some of the geography that is going to impact uh, the Southeast nation's way of life. Uh, we know that the low rolling hills and sort of fertile soil of the Piedmont uh, is going to be sort of super impactful. We know that this area has um, part of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and we also know that there are some coastal areas um, that'll have some impact as well. So who exactly were the Southeast nations? Uh, they are actually the first region to adopt um, agriculture. And we sort of see the um, effect of that in their villages tend to number right under a thousand. Um, they are large permanent settlements. We also see that because they've adopted agriculture, that they also are the first to sort of organize their society in sort of a really strict hierarchy. They're the first to organize their society around chiefdoms. Uh, we also see in some Southeast nations, uh, we see forms of slavery. Uh, we see that prisoners of war who are taken during conflict are um, put into slavery uh, and become part of that social hierarchy. Uh, one sort of really important place for us to know uh, when we think about the Southeast nations um, is Cahokia, which was a huge trading center on the Mississippi River that had at its highest point sort of 40,000 people living there. Um, so the Southeast nations did have large permanent settlements due to agriculture. So moving westward, moving towards sort of the Midwest, um, part of what we now know as the United States, uh, we have the Plains Nations. Um, and the Plains Nations are in sort of that Midwest corridor uh, in places like Montana, uh, Wyoming, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, and these Plains Nations, um, the, the geography is sort of really going to impact them. We know that it's a very dry climate with hot summers and cold winters. There are some mountains, um, but it's mostly just sort of flat grassland. It's mostly flat grassland. So because, um, of sort of that flat grassland, um, we actually see the Plains Nations sort of turn from uh, agriculture to hunter, to becoming hunter-gatherers. Um, the Midwest is sort of a really good place uh, to farm, but we see that sort of a drought in the 1300s sort of made the Plains Nations uh, sort of adapt to a new way of life and they sort of shift from farming to being hunter gatherers um and we do see that some groups uh adopt sort of hunter gatherer lifestyles and agriculture um, again we do see that there are sort of variations uh between regions um between indigenous nations within regions um and so um, one of the big things that sort of defines the Plains Nation um, as we think of them today are um, the introduction of horses. Uh, the Plains Nations were sort of pretty equal in terms of sort of a social hierarchy, but once the Spanish um, begin to colonize parts of the Americas and horses are introduced, 
uh, we start to see a, a hierarchy and um, intertribal violence occur um, as a result of horses being introduced to those Plains nations. Next up, we've got the Great Basin Nations. Um, these are sort of nations that are in what we now think of as like the Western United States. Um, there are some pretty big geographic boundaries in the Great Basin. We see that it's sort of a mix of deserts and lakes. Um, there's sort of between these two mountain ranges with the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and so those geographic features are really going to impact sort of what these nations do. So the Great Basin nations are sort of small groups of hunter-gatherers. Um, they really don't have permanent settlements. Um, it's very hard to grow crops um, in this Great Basin area, so there is sort of no agriculture. And because there are limited food resources, we actually see sort of very small groups. Um, this is sort of a really big difference than what we see with the Northeast and the Southeast regions that have sort of villages of thousands. Um, the Great Basin nations are sort of very, very small. Um, it's also important to note that the uh, that these nations are the first to sort of build and create canoes to sort of help with the fishing process. So next up, uh, we have the Plateau Nations, again, sort of moving a little bit west, um, sort of moving into Western Canada. And again, we're going to see that the geography um, sort of really impacts the way of life of the Plateau Nations. They're sort of between these two rivers, and so there is a lot of wooded area, a lot of grassland. They're surrounded by mountain ranges on, on various sides, um, and most of the precipitation that they get is snow. So the Plateau Nations, again, aren't going to um, have agriculture. Um, they're going to sort of travel um, especially um, during those summer months. They're a little more settled during the winter um, along riverbanks. Um, there's really not a social hierarchy. Again, these are sort of smaller groups based on the availability of resources. But one thing that's sort of really interesting about the Plateau Nations is because of their location, they are next to many different, um, many different regions. Uh, and we sort of see the Plateau Nations become this sort of crossroads of culture um, with trade networks uh, sort of popping up all around them. So they were sort of on these trade routes meaning that they had interactions with many different groups, uh, not only within the Plateau region, but with the Pacific uh, Northwest Coast regions, with the Great Basin regions, with the California regions. Um, because of their location, they sort of become this sort of center for trading. Next up, we have the subarctic nations. Uh, these nations are located in what we now think of as Alaska and Canada. Um, their geography, again, is going to sort of really impact how they live. They have the taiga, um, which is sort of swampy forests. And they also have the tundra, which is sort of permanent frozen soil. Um, there's very cold winter, very snowy, um, and we're not going to see a whole lot of agriculture um, in the subarctic nations. So again, sort of similar to what we see in the Great Basin, in the Plateau, um, the subarctic nations are nomadic hunter-gatherers. 
uh, in small family groups. Um, there are really no more than 20 or 30 people in a group. Um, they really stressed the importance of group well-being over individual well-being. Um, because resources were so scarce, uh, there is a push to make sure that sort of everyone is taken care of. Uh, and because of that snow, um, travel is sort of really difficult. But again, there's still sort of this push to come together in larger groups uh, for seasonal gatherings. Next up, we have the Northwest Coast Nations. Um, this is sort of one of the smaller regions in the um, in the in North America, um, but we sort of see these nations sort of spread along the Pacific Coast from British Columbia and Canada, sort of all the way down to Northern California. Um, and we see that there are sort of really distinct boundaries of the Pacific Ocean and then the Coast Range Mountains. Um, and we see that the ocean and also many rivers sort of provided this region with a lot of natural resources. And so the Northwest Coast Nations are actually really unique in the sense that they were hunter-gatherers but they had permanent settlements. The rivers and the oceans um, around where they settled had so many natural resources um, that they were able to settle permanently without having agriculture um, to help them build permanent settlements. Um, so we set, see settlements into the hundreds. Uh, we also see in the Northwest Coast, sort of similar to the Southeast, there is a very strict social structure. And your status is determined by how close you are to those in power, by how much you own. Um, and so the, the Northwest Coast probably has the strictest social structure out of all the nine regions that we're, that we're looking at. So next up, we've got the California nations. Um, and the California nations uh, are sort of in what we now think of as the state of California, uh, even down some into Mexico. Um, and California is an incredibly diverse place. There are many different ecosystems and environments. Um, so the California nations are pro probably the most diverse um, in North America at this time. We see groups adapting to living along the coast, in deserts, around mountains, uh, in forests. So the California nations are the most diverse um, of the nine regions. So the California nations, again, they're the most diverse region in North America, but they're also the most populated. This is where we see the majority of indigenous um, people living before um, the start of colonization. Uh, we see that uh, we have small family-based bands of hunter-gatherers um, called triblets. Um, there's little to no agriculture. Again, um, the natural resources in California sort of allow them uh, to survive as hunter-gatherers. And we see that there are well-established systems of trade and sort of common rights between these triblets. And there's very little conflict in the California nations uh, because everybody um, sort of relies on others for trade. Um, and so there is very little conflict for, for the California nations. And then last but not least, we have the Southwest nations. Um, we sort of think of the Southwest as um, sort of what we think of now as the Southwest region of the United States. Um, 
that geography, it is very dry. There's little rainfall. The elevation um, varies. Um, some places are very flat. Other places um, are uh, higher off the ground. So we're going to see that the Southwest nations sort of adapt to their geography in a really unique way. So we also see that some uh, consider the Southwest nations uh, sort of the first farmers. Um, they, they settled near waterways where they could, um, but because it is so dry in the desert, they actually built these incredibly complex irrigation systems um, so they could live in permanent settlements around agriculture. Um, so while there is little rainfall in the desert, they were able to find a way to build systems um, to be successful with, um, with agriculture. And they had permanent settlements into the thousands, into the thousands. Um, some Southwest nations were nomadic as hunter-gatherer groups, um, but those complex irrigation systems that some Southwest nations were able to build allowed their population to grow into the thousands. And sort of similar to the Southeast nation, the Southwest nation had a trade hub um, that numbered sort of over 12,000 people. And that is Chaco Canyon. Um, there were folks from um, sort of uh, lower North American nations who would travel through Chaco Canyon. And they created over 400 miles of road to connect remote villages so they could be connected to this sort of trading hub. So that is just sort of a very brief overview of these nine regions. Um, even within these regions, we see lots and lots of differences with specific indigenous nations. Um, but we can sort of draw out some similarities based on their region. Uh, thank you so much, and I will see you in class.